Welcome back to the House of Knowledge, Wisdom, Evolution, and Revolution. It's your boy, the one and only, A.K. Debris. This is the first of many episodes um, of the documentaries that I've been promising and talking about. So, welcome to it. I hope you guys enjoy this. Get comfortable. Grab a bottle of water and let's get right into it. Recently, the topic that has been taking the internet by storm was the recent seizure of the website Raid Forums. A very popular, or not so popular, I mean, I haven't heard of it until it got seized, to be honest, website where People conducted cybercrime, if you will. I guess they sold and traded whatever type of illicit cyber <laughs> fraud, fraud and fraud accessories, materials, etc. You would think that I would cover raid forms, even though I find that interesting and I hope to cover that topic because I have a lot to say on that specific topic, but I decided to take you guys back and give you a history lesson instead. A history lesson on a topic that a lot of people I don't see covering online. I'm going to take you guys back to where it all started. Before there was a young thug, it had to be a Lil Wayne. Before it was a Lil Wayne, it had to be a Michael Jackson. And before Raid Forms, it came ancestors to it that you might have probably never ever heard of. You're watching this video on YouTube.com. YouTube.com came to birth or came to life at the year 2004. That's a long time ago now. But let's take it back a little bit before that. Let's take it back all the way to spring 2001. Odessa, Ukraine. 150 of the best hackers, swipers, carters, and cyber criminals in Eastern Europe link up and discuss how they can bring their efforts together online. Before that, there was no hub online for everybody to link up. It was just more so um, independent little groups or IRC or whatever they called it. Just independent efforts all over the place. There was no place where everybody can kind of come together. Again, this is way before social media and definitely way before YouTube. The closest thing to such thing would have probably been a MySpace, and obviously, MySpace wouldn't have allowed such activities to run rampant on their website. This is very early, by the way, so I don't even think there was a cyber awareness to such activity and what it could lead to or it even being dangerous, illegal, etc. Moving on. The meeting would lead to the formation of a website called Carter Planet. The website was a forum, essentially. It facilitated the sale of stolen credit card info, counterfeit credit cards, money laundering, and many other illicit services. Carter Planet is really the foundation of online fraud marketplaces and it set the standard for all the sites that would appear in the coming years. As cybercrime increased in Eastern Europe and credit card companies were becoming aware, it became important for Carter Planet users to find individuals in other parts of the world that would cash out their crimes. The site would open an English forum to attract users from America 
UK, and other English-speaking countries. Yes, Carter Planet used to be only in Russian or other Eastern European languages as such. Searching for new customers would lead Dmitry Golobov, aka Script, a prominent member, prominent swiper of Carter Planet, to a UK based forum called Counterfeit Library. Hey, yo, fam, welcome to Counterfeit Library, fam. You get me? We got it all, fam. You want the ID? You want the diploma in it? You want the social security card in it? Fam, come, come get it, fam. Man's gonna hit the trap in it. Man's like waiting on some food to land from Ireland. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, woo. Up until now, the website focused on the sale of counterfeit documents such as IDs, diplomas, social security cards, etc., etc. So Script makes a post offering stolen credit card info and was contacted by an admin on the website named Brett Johnson, a.k.a. Gollum Fun. We're going to get into Brett's story later. Now, Brett wasn't really swiping at the time. He was just getting his feet wet in terms of fraud. See, Brett at the time specialized in eBay and PayPal fraud. He was known on the website for being a product reviewer on the website. For example, you pop up on the website and you start selling CCs, whatever it is you sell. People need to validate are you true or not before someone will spend their hard-earned money with you. And that's where he would come in and test your product out and then give a fair, honest review. He was kind of like the trusted middleman who would um, more like a, 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 a better business or a business bureau for businesses or maybe a Yelp. Think of him like a Yelp review for fraud. <laughs> more like a Google reviews. You know Google reviews? So, Dimitri just got his chance here to get his stuff reviewed and get his name on a site established. So, he was given a burner phone number and an address to send the info to, which Brett received. Now, Brett's first attempt at using the info failed. You know, at this moment, Dimitri is sweating like, My brother, you have to trust me, my brother. I promise this CC is good. You must try again, try again. Brett told him, I'm going to give you only one more chance. Let's see how this goes. Lucky for him, the second attempt worked. Brett swiped successfully $9,000 worth of goods. Almost overnight, Counterfeit Library expanded to a marketplace for stolen info. And when the need for an American site arises, it eventually transitions into the well-known site Shadow Crew, Brett Johnson being the leader. He led the website along with his associates, Kim Taylor, a.k.a. McGavier, and Seth Sander, a.k.a. Kid. Kind of like Crispy Life Kid with two Ds. Kid. Shadow Crew would rise to prominence in 2002 and shared many members with Carter Planet. Users could have made money on the site selling the stolen info or by purchasing the info and then using it to swipe products or purchase products later reselling the products online. Hackers who had the credit card numbers would hire other users to encode the information on blank cards using MSRs and whatnot. 
and then use them to withdraw money from ATMs. Let's call them the ATM cashers. Good thing. Now the cashers were kind of like employees. Their job was to go and swipe this card at the ATM and they would keep a small portion of the profits and send the rest back to their employers on the other side of the world. As you can see, trust was an essential part of these forms as someone could easily begin ripping or becoming a ripper or running off with the entire profit from an ATM. The organization of these sites allowed members like this to be banned. But in a world where people can be using multiple aliases or identities, the best deterrent was the possibility of being hurt or killed by your employer if they ever found you. This period from 2001 through 2002 could be seen as a sort of golden age for Carter Planet and Shadow Crew. Money was flowing and both buyers and sellers were very happy. Things would change, however, when a series of arrests would leave the online fraud community flooded with feds and law enforcement from all around the world. November 2002, Lissaka, Washington. A well-known user of Counterfeit Library and now Shadow Crew named David Thomas, aka El Mariachi, has been working for a Ukrainian man named Big Buyer. Brett had introduced the two and Big Buyer sent David money to rent the office space in Osaka, Washington, to function as kind of a drop address for the products they swipe. Obviously, they're not going to be sending it to their own addresses, so they need a drop address. Big Buyer, who got his name by maxing out credit cards, he would purchase products online and have them shipped over to David. David would then resell them on eBay and split the profits with Big Buyer. Kim Taylor would then ask Brett to let him go up to Osaka and get in on the business as well. In November, Big Buyer would make the two largest purchases ever to ever be made on Outpost.com, the biggest they have ever received up that point, totaling to over $30,000, 30 bands. Outpost was going crazy. The large orders raised suspicions up at Outpost.com, so Outpost.com contacted the Osaka Police Department. David and his girlfriend and Kim Taylor drove to pick up the products when they landed from the office complex it was delivered to. But see, pulling into the parking lot, David's weirdo radar started going off. David's sus meter was going crazy. David notices an empty Crown Victoria and he becomes suspicious. Worrying about undercover police, David remains in the vehicle and Kim enters the building to pick up the product. But Kim is promptly arrested by the Isaka police. David and his girlfriend flee down the road, but are later pulled over and arrested as well. Brett Johnson was able to bail out Kim, who later returned to Shadow Crew. However, when David got arrested, 
he turned to Takashi 69 He told the police if they bring him federal agents, he can lead them to a much larger story. April 2003 Five months after his arrest in Osaka, David Thomas begins working for the FBI. His alter ego, El Mariachi, returns to the online fraud community. But people wasn't feeling it. People knew something wasn't right. Mariachi got met with some backlash. A post would appear on Carter Planet containing David's police report. This ignited a feud as Kim accused David of selling him out to the feds. There was a big back and forth between members who some supported David and some called him a straight up snitch, a rat or a Tekashi 69 of the time on Carter Planet and Shadow Crew. But since users used often multiple aliases, the community knew someone was a snitch, but just didn't agree on who it could be or who it was. This created some tension and created an air of paranoia with users to the point where they often jokingly accused each other of being a fed. You're a fed. Nah, you a fed. Ha ha ha. LOL. Fast forward to summer 2003. Shadow Crew continued to expand and required more admins to review product and oversee the forums. In the summer of 2003, a new kid on a black came up. A hacker named Albert Gonzalez, aka Kumbajani, would become an active member of the community. See, this new kid on the black is very interesting, and I plan to do a separate video on him later, because his story is very, very crazy. But moving on. He would become an active member on the community and later on earn the admin title on the site. See, Albert was uh 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 see Albert was a hot boy. This new kid on the block knew how to raise hell and hit big, but the problem is he wasn't very good at covering his tracks or staying out of trouble because it isn't too long before Albert runs into trouble. July the 3rd, 2003, Albert decides to cash out some cards he had at the ATM. Usually swipers would be hitting different ATMs, masked up and being slick about it not sloppy. But the problem is when the greed kicks in, okay, people tend to be sloppy, which I believe happened in Albert's case. Albert had a bunch of cards, but he didn't have a bunch of patience to cash out such cards. He decided to cash them out all at the same ATM. It was close to midnight, which Albert used to his advantage because he knew he couldn't hit the cards a second time when the new day began. See, every card has an ATM limit. For example, $800 daily or $1,000 daily average. However, if you stand at the ATM at eleven fifty nine and swipe, by the time 12 hit, you've entered a new limit, and you can now max out the second limit. So, 
he planned it out to swipe all these cards at the same time at one ATM. But he is spotted by a plainclothes police officer dressed as a civilian. Police officer becomes suspicious and approaches him. One thing leads to another, and Kumbadani is in cuffs. He is arrested. News of the arrest made its way all the way to Secret Service's Electronic Crimes Task Force. This wasn't the everyday case at the regular state police. So, of course, they had to get some help from the Electronic Crimes Task Force. Albert, just like our friend earlier, immediately turns into Takashi 69 and is hired, debriefed, and quickly begins working as a paid informant for the Secret Service. He then returns to Shadow Crew without any of the members knowing of his arrest. December 2003. At this point, the FBI and the Secret Service both have informants working online and continuing to commit crimes. Yes, I know. They let them commit crimes. Crazy, right? It's kind of a competition thing between the FBI and the Secret Service, both of them competing on who can get more funding or crack this case first as it's a hot case and, frankly, a first-of-its-kind kind of case at the time. This is 2001, 2003, to be honest. Early 2000s, you get it. Not every day they're cracking down or shutting down such websites. Silk Road didn't even come till years after. So this is early. This is juicy for them, okay? Facebook wasn't even there. This was the next big thing as far as cybercrime goes. Albert and David, the snitches, returned to the community, all the while detailing to their federal government how the schemes worked. Taxpayer dollars are literally being spent to commit fraud and identity theft on average people at this point. The fraud continued, although a large portion of it was being done with the knowledge of law enforcement and the permission of law enforcement. But the funding and the money began drying up. So in December, the FBI put their uh, 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 best minds together and launched a website called The Grifters with David, a.k.a. El Mariachi, leading it. It ran with the same motto as Shadow Crew and Carter Planet, and it acted as an alternative for members of those sites who kind of have been having issues. Early 2004. Through the Grifters website, David Thomas began working with a spammer known as King Arthur. King Arthur went to the grifters with money from dealings on Shadow Crew began slowing down. King's specialty was phishing attacks, which was still rather new. David's FBI handlers approved the move because they wanted to learn how these phishing attacks operated. With the help of a coder named Myth David, David and King developed a system to encode blank credit cards with stolen info and ship them to cashers across the country automatically. The info was stolen by launching a phishing attack against U.S. Bank. And it was successful. With the success 
of U.S. Bank, the trio decided to try the FDIC. Yes, the same FDIC that insures your account $250,000 in case of fraud, theft, etc., etc. The same FDIC. However, this one wasn't that successful. The FDIC was tipped off by law enforcement. All while David was busy working with King, Albert and the Secret Service were busy also engineering the downfall of Shadow Crew and the rest of the online fraud community. So, when February comes of 2004, Albert by now have gained more power and sway on the website. He proposes security concerns. But of course, when he comes with the sickness, he also has a medicine for it. His medicine for those security concerns was for Shadow Crew users to move on to his VPN. So he begins asking Shadow Crew users to move onto his VPN for security purposes. But of course, yes, you guessed it, the network had a backdoor to the feds. Albert also tried to sabotage the grifters by sending a copy of David's police report to King after learning about their dealings together. When Mars comes, Dmitry Golubov, aka Scrip, disappears completely from Carter Planet. And Albert takes on a leadership role on that website. David took notice of this and hit Albert with his own accusations. They were both calling out each other for being snitches and coming with receipts to back it up. David would taunt Albert, calling him Kumba Cop, and asking if he had gotten rid of the script. David's FBI handlers, <laughs> David's FBI handlers recognized who he was messaging and immediately told him to never speak to Albert again. They feared the Secret Service would shut down the FBI's investigation. Later on in March, a hacker named Ethics gained access to T-Mobile's network and stole the billing and password information for 14 million customers. One of those customers, however, was a Secret Service agent, and on his account, Ethics found evidence of something called Project Firewall. Project Firewall was the Secret Service's code name for their work with Albert to take down Shadow Crew. Very alarming. This document Ethics found stated that the Secret Service was working with an unknown informant. The information made its rounds across the forums online, increasing fear and paranoia among members of the community. Given these circumstances, the leader of Shadow Crew, Brett Johnson, aka Gollum Fun, retires from Shadow Crew on April 15, 2004. He had seen the documents from T Mobile. And that, combined with the appearance of government IPs on the website, convinced Brett he needed to leave Shadow Crew. This allows Albert, then, to take complete control of the website and is eventually completely moved on to his VPN entirely. Then in July, Carter Planet seizes operations. 
King Arthur was a leader at the site after one of its cashers, a man named Douglas Harvard, was arrested in the UK. And he decided to take the site underground. Activity continued on Shadow Crew and the Grifters until September when the FBI decides to shut down the Grifters and, in proxy, ending David Thomas's work with them. One month later, on October 26th at 9 p.m., Albert calls out a meeting to the Shadow Crew administrators. The Secret Service needed to catch them in the act. And in the middle of the meeting, the law enforcement raid began. They began to raid the homes of Shadow Crew members. Members and leaders like Kim Taylor are arrested at 28 locations across eight states and six countries. Brett have dodged the raids. Brett Johnson's retirement saved him from being arrested in the raid. However, he then becomes one of the most wanted men in America and decides to go on the run. He decided to pull a take and do the race. Albert is then relocated to Miami by the Secret Service for his own safety and continues working for them. Shadow Crew's homepage is replaced with a message from the Secret Service telling the remaining members to contact authorities before they are contacted first. And with that, this was the end of Shadow Crew. This was the end of the story of Shadow Crew. However, it is not the end of Albert or Brett's story. Oh no. Brett is eventually arrested and begins working with the Secret Service as well. Brett and Albert's story both deserve their own separate episodes because they are full of juicy details that you don't want to miss out. Albert and Brett will both end up double-crossing the feds and committing crimes under their noses. And this remains, to this day, one of the most fascinating internet fraud crime stories. A aroma of fear and paranoia still haunted the fraud communities online, especially the Eastern European ones, where they began to trust less the English-speaking ones due to fear of them being FBI or other law enforcement. Because after that takedown, this was the beginning of the feds catching on to these websites. And again, this is way before a dark web. This was not the end of these communities as we have seen with raid forums. I believe the arrest of the kid at Raid Farms. I mean, legally justified, sure, but also, I believe it was too much. The kid may have made a little bit of money, but I believe there are other ways to treat such people. Instead of trying to fill a government quota, because obviously, as we have seen here, the government didn't mind having their informants or snitches committing crimes under their noses on average people using taxpayer dollars. So 
Obviously, fraud is not really what you're against here. You're just trying to fill a quota to get funding or whatever else personal gain. So, in my opinion, law enforcement, you guys are no better than the same fraudsters you claim are the bad people. When I look at China and I look at Russia, they give their hackers chances to participate ethically in you know, a country's interests, wherever that may be. Maybe instead of locking up the Twitter hacker, how about you give him an opportunity to uh, spread his wings in a legal manner? Because obviously, if such an opportunity was provided to the Twitter hacker, he wouldn't have ended up doing what he did for a petty Bitcoin scam. But again, what do I know? I'm just the guy online. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, make sure to hit the like button, smash the subscribe button. The research for this piece was done by the head of my research team, Izzy. His own YouTube channel is on the way, and me and him are also working currently on some very juicy stuff for you guys. He is under the weather, so you guys pray for him. Hopefully, we can get out more juicy content for you guys. Consider this a history lesson. There's a lot of lessons to be learned here. Carter Planet, I don't know if it still exists, but when I looked it up, it seems that there's a bunch of clones of Carter Planet. I want to let you know all of them are fake and they're either scams or honeypots set up by law enforcement. I don't recommend you do any fraud or any illegal activities. This video was purely for entertainment purposes. With that being said, I'm going to leave you guys. Hopefully, you can enjoy the rest of your day or night if you're watching this as you sleep. Again, don't forget to hit the like button, smash the subscribe button. It's your boy AK, and I'll see you in the next one.